So welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this uh, fifth edition of the Data Privacy Day today here in Belval and for you all online, unfortunately. So my name is Cynthia Wang and I'll be your host for today. The topic of this year's Data Privacy Day is exploring the shifting landscape of European data protection. So I am very thankful that we can have so many wonderful speakers today. And with this, I will no longer stay in between you and this beautiful session, so enjoy the conference. And with this, I would like to introduce you our welcome speech of this year's, Ms. Isabella Ripota, the DPO from the International Atomic Energy Agency, with her title, The Implementation of the Privacy Program at the International Atomic Energy Agency. And she will speak about the implementation of a privacy policy within the agency. Isabella, the floor is yours. Thank you and good morning. I hope you can all hear me well. Um, I'm very pleased to be speaking at this event today, and I will take you through the privacy journey at the IAEA, which is a technical organization part of the UN family. I will share my screen so that you can um, see my presentation. I think you should be seeing it now. So in my presentation, I will um, touch upon the specific context of the UN, I will explain how the agency approached privacy, like. activities were undertaken in this context, what gaps were identified, and I will provide an overview of the current data protection regulatory framework at the agency and finally discuss challenges and opportunities, in particular relating to the GDPR. I understand there will be some time to take questions at the end. The UN privacy context is such that since their establishment, UN system organizations have had among their key purposes and guiding principles the promotion, protection of, um, and respect for human rights, including the right to privacy. The fundamental right to privacy is enshrined in several instruments of international human rights law adopted under the auspices of the United Nations. In 2018, the HICM adopted a set of personal data protection and privacy principles. The United Nations High Level Committee on Management, the HICM, acts on behalf of and in the name of the United Nations Chief Executive Board for Coordination um, on matters affecting the administrative management of all organizations. This is the highest level coordination forum of the United Nations system and chaired by the UN Secretary General. Later, the IEA used the principles with small modifications and published them as its own personal data privacy policy. The policy was approved by the Director General in 2020. Over the years, United Nations system organizations have adopted internal regulations, rules, and procedures on the protection of personal data in conformity with the Charter of the United Nations. As a matter of law, it is only those um, rules that may apply to the handling of data by UN organizations. An external regulatory framework, such as the GDPR, may not be imposed neither directly nor indirectly on the activities of United Nations system organizations. Under international law, several obligations exist that require states not to interfere with the governance of UN organizations by seeking to regulate their internal workings outside of the established intergovernmental processes intended to do so. Furthermore, in addition to the regulatory frameworks developed by the UN system organizations, the framework of privileges and immunities accorded to those organizations under international law also protects all data, including personal data from external interference. For the agency, the agency has a very varied mandate. The agency is headquartered in Vienna and was created in 1957 in response to the deep fears and expectations generated by the discoveries and diverse uses of nuclear technology. The agency's genesis was US President Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace address to the General Assembly of the United Nations in, on December 8, 1953. The agency has six departments with very varied programs. 
Department of Nuclear Energy, which supports member states by providing scientific and technical support for the development of nuclear power. Department of Nuclear Applications, which supports the peaceful uses of nuclear science and applications. Department of Nuclear Security and Safety, which promotes the highest levels of nuclear safety and security throughout the world. Department of Safeguards, this is the nuclear verifications. Um, you may know inspectors who travel to Iran to check um, the nuclear power plants there. Um, this supports the statutory mandate to establish and administer safeguards designed to ensure that these materials and facilities are not used to further any military purpose. Department of Management providing support services, and finally, Department of Technical Cooperation um, for the development and implementation of technical cooperation projects with member states. The IAEA's privacy journey spans a timeline from 2019 to 2021. 2019 was dedicated to the development of the policy, while in 2020, the first guidance on data mapping and gap analysis were done. And in 2021, the expansion of the privacy regulatory framework took place. Activities were aligned with the aim of achieving compliance with the agency's own policy, as well as with the objective of achieving a positive outcome for the pillars assessment conducted by the EU. The EU Pillars Assessment, for those who may not know, is a review of the systems and procedures by the EU of entities implementing funds under the future Invest EU program. These entities need to meet requirements which relate inter alia to the internal control system, accounting system, independent external audit, etc., and also the protection of personal data, the so called Pillar 9. Under this assessment, the agency needs to show that it has a clear legal and regulatory framework and that the requirements for personal data protection are integrated in the procedures and rules. In 2019, the situation, the HICM had just adopted the UN principles, which were very high level. The GDPR had already been enforced for more than a year. It was on one side the text of the GDPR, and on the other side, confusion as to whether the agency had to comply with the GDPR at all. The data issue was owned by the division of IT at the time, and so the effect of the GDPR was first felt there. IT was the first stakeholder to having to deal with the practical questions arising from the GDPR. A working group <clears throat> was established to start drafting an agency privacy policy. This group included all the relevant data processing stakeholders, the IT division, including the CISO, the agency archivist, the HR division, the master data, and of course, the Office of Legal Affairs. The level of privacy awareness was relatively low at the time. People were asking, is a name personal data, or do we have to provide information to data subjects about everything we do and we hold all the data we hold about them? Um, because as an international organization, the staff involved in data processing came with different data protection regulatory backgrounds pertaining to their home countries, and that also contributed to the confusion by staff. The working group made an effort to operationalize and translate the high-level UN principles into something practical and implementable, which would provide answers to those questions raised at the technical level. But due to the low level of privacy maturity in general at the time, the low level of knowledge relative to personal data processes in particular, it was impossible for the privacy group to settle on a single policy proposal <clears throat> to put forward. So after one year of several iterations, the privacy group still had not made any significant progress towards being able to present a draft for approval and alignment. Eventually, the working group came to the conclusion that it would be best to adopt the UN principles as its own policy. Better to have something than nothing. It was aspirational and high level enough to avoid the risk of non-compliance with its own policy, while it provided the framework for further regulatory development at its own pace. <clears throat> it was meant to complement existing policies, which, although not specifically mentioned in privacy and data protection, had a practical effect on privacy, such as the information security policy, 
directed policy, the CCTV policy and the HR policy on the processing of personnel information. The language in the agency's policy, just like in the UN principles, remains aspirational through its continued use of the word should and not shall. As I mentioned, it all started in 2018 with the GDPR problem, being tossed between the IT division, who felt the effects of the GDPR, and the legal office, who was asked to provide advice to the CISO and CISO, to the CISO and CIO on uh, the practical issues that they were um, faced with. But in the absence of a regulatory framework applicable to the agency, our lawyers could not really provide any answers except the GDPR does not apply to the agency. And no one wanted to have the hot potato. Data protection was not only a legal problem, nor was it solely an IT issue. It really needed a combination of both and something more to, be, to being able to be addressed. It was at this time that the agency archivist and chief records manager provided a list of agency records containing personal data to the Deputy Director General for Management. The list was endlessly long, and the majority of relevant records were in the custody of the Department of Management. This is then when the Deputy Director General decided that management needed to own this and took it over, and so the working group was set up with the lead being in the Executive Office. From the beginning, therefore, there was a close cooperation between the Data Protection Officer, the Office of Legal Affairs, the CISO, and also the records function. And until today, this close cooperation is a clear success factor. Also, a survey organized by the UN in 2019 confirmed that this type of cross-functional cooperation is really one of the key success factors, at least for UN organizations um, in the implementation of a privacy framework. Under the agency's policy, the principle of accountability states that the agency should have adequate policies, procedures, and processes in place to adhere to its policy. It was under this principle, and at the same time as the policy was approved, that the role of data protection officer was established. As you can see on the slide as well, other privacy and data protection governance roles were established and described at the time to operationalize this principle, and they now represent the agency's personal data governance. There are few, two main building blocks that um, we use when developing the policy and implementing the principles. When the privacy policy was adopted, it was proposed as an integral part of the agency's overall legal framework concerning data governance. In the context of the agency, this meant foremost the information security policy, which had been enforced for long and which had been shaped by the need to protect very sensitive and confidential data entrusted to the agency by its member states, relative, for example, to building plans of nuclear power plants, which needed to be protected from terrorist threats. Um, and were classified as highly confidential. Today, the agency is working towards ISO 27001 certification, which is also an important component of any organization's privacy program. The other building block is a very well established records management program. Records retention schedules and archives um, are managed in the agency. Um, it was another sound building block for the implementation of the policy as it ensured compliance with the principal retention, which says personal data should be retained only for the time that is necessary for the specified purposes. So continue now to 2020. This was the year the privacy policy was approved and the first project plan for the implementation, implementation of the policy was drafted. During this time, the working group was consolidated as it was called upon to weigh in on discussions between the UN Secretariat on one side and the EU on the other side on the application of the GDPR. This included inter alia the provision of comments 
unadopted EDPB guidelines. A major milestone to kick off the implementation of the policy was the launch of the data mapping. The first guidance document, therefore, that was drafted below the level of the policy was the data mapping guidance, which laid out the principles, purpose, and accountabilities for data mapping. The data mapping allowed the agency not only to have its first insight into the varied data processes, but also to identify clearly the existing gaps for each process and overall. And these activities were undertaken against the backdrop of the ongoing discussions between the UN and the EC on the conduction of the pillars assessment on data protection. Now, the data mapping revealed three interesting facts for the agency. The majority of personal data the agency needed to fulfill its mandate was not very sensitive. So the agency, unlike other UN organizations such as UNHCR, IOM, WFP, was not catering towards vulnerable beneficiaries. And the most sensitive personal data we were collecting really was medical data of employees, which anyway had already been classified as confidential under the existing information security framework and which was regulated on the separate rules um, in the agency. Secondly, the largest amount of non-employee personal data was related to meeting and conference participants. Technical meetings and conferences are one of the programmatic activities which are linked to the implementation of our mandate, and that involves the processing of third party personal data. And these were definitely not vulnerable groups, but they were well respected scientists or other representatives of member states. Thirdly, the data maps clearly showed that there was definitely no issue with the technical and IT security measures, but a gap was related to the absence of information to data subjects about the processing of their data. It was simply non-existent, and that was the downside of the strong information security culture. The work to close the gaps, as identified, had started as soon as 2020 and was finalized in 21 just in time for the EU pillars assessment. Privacy compliance is working progress anyway. So on the transparency side, privacy notices were drafted and they cover a large part of the data subjects um, whose data is being processed by or on behalf of the agency. On the accountability side, on the regulatory side, procedures and guidelines were issued to complement the policy. They're included in the agency's regulatory framework. They include inter alia, a personal data breach procedure and a privacy impact assessment tool. So eventually now, at the beginning of 2022, after the publication of the relevant guidelines, procedures and processes, the agency's regulatory framework for privacy and personal data includes three levels. Level one, the IEA established personal data and privacy policy as approved by the Director General. Level two are those documents that cover additional procedures and guidelines. Um, we have one, for example, as well covering um, the recording of virtual events or events with virtual participation. Level three, those documents, which are the records that allow the agency to demonstrate compliance with the principles it adopted. They include the collected data maps, information notices, personal data breach logs, data request logs, and training materials. As the policy was intended to be an integral part of the agency's existing framework covering data governance, other specific policies pertaining to different areas greatly influence the application of the principles. A good alignment between those areas allows to increase their positive effects through the exclusion of inconsistencies, gaps, or regulatory contradictions. So the specific policies also related to other business areas provide regulatory guidance in particular for the principal retention of the privacy policy and the principal security. But organizational resilience and physical security also pertaining to security, also play an important role in this unregulatory 
interdependency. As the agency makes progress towards alignment with its principles, it's clear that always will remain a tension, which cannot be resolved through policies or further procedures or guidances alone, as it is intrinsic to the issues related to privacy, and they will always require a case-by-case -case review. The organization needs to find the right balance between its own interests and the interests of data subjects. This is a discussion and a perspective that was introduced only with the adoption of the policy. This includes interests in um, <clears throat> information security and confidentiality versus transparency, as well as interests of the data subjects versus the interests related to the archiving in the public interest here um, under the principal retention. And of course, there remains the fundamental tension between the GDPR's applicability or non-applicability to the agency, the agency's own regulatory framework, which is the only binding one. And although the GDPR is not directly applicable to the agency, given its independent status and privileges and immunities, as a practical matter, it has had a real impact on its activities and that of other UN system organizations, in particular related to transfer of data. But then again, as all challenges are also opportunities to expand, there is much work ahead to continue the fascinating privacy journey at the agency. And with this, I'm at the end of my presentation. I thank you very much for your attention and I understand that there may be some time to take a few questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabella Ripota. Thank you very much and welcome to everybody. My name is Constance Metzger and I will moderate the session and I will lead you through the session. So let me give you just some information how this will um, work out. So we will have different presentations and I'm really happy to see so many different speakers with a variety of topics on data protection. If you have questions on their presentations, please put your question in the chat and we will answer them after the presentation. If you have by chance questions after the conference, uh, you can send an email to communication at prestena at lu and we will come back to you and answer your questions immediately. So um, with no um, further delay, I uh, will give uh, the next uh, the floor to the next speaker, to my colleague, Sandrine Munoz, and she is giving a presentation on the question of data privacy and protection in research. So uh, Sandrine, you have the floor. As a DPO, I really um, thank you, Isabella, for your presentation, because it was really interesting, your privacy program in your national uh, United Nations uh, agency. I, ha I have a question as DPO. Uh, what do you think, uh, what are the, the, the key factors of a good awareness? Do you have some advice on it? Do you have some uh, uh, things to, to, to share with us? Thank you for your question. The good factors, good factors for awareness, I think it's only training, training and awareness raising. Um, it, it's difficult because the agency has a rotation policy, which means we have a large part of our staff that rotates on a regular basis, about 25 to 30 percent of our staff rotate. This is maybe also why we have integrated strong um, training programs for newcomers, and this is really the avenue that we need to use to spread the awareness of privacy throughout the organization. Okay, thank you. I think, yeah, you, 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 you're fully right. It's really to train, train, and train again, yeah. Hmm. Oh, 
I have another question. So um, if you agree, I would um, I would um, ask the question: What um, what about the use of technology to enforce rules on users? What are your thoughts? Thank you for the question. This is um, related to a certain extent to the um, question of internal controls and the enforcement of the rules. Um, use of technology to enforce rules has the advantage that there is less error in the enforcement, so to speak, because we do not depend on people. Once you have a program that allows you, or a software that allows you to do certain things and not other things, you are pretty certain that whatever you decided that was possible would actually be enforced. So it's a very strong enforcement tool, but it also has the downside of not allowing exceptions. So there comes a cost associated with it. Once you change the rules, you need to change technology as well. But certainly on the way to privacy, technology is an ally. And this is also why there needs to be such a strong coordination between data privacy and information security. Um, because information security, it's all about technology. And therefore, I believe that using technology in the right way to enforce rules is <laughs> um, it's, it's there and it's our future. It happens all the time. It's how to use it and we need to be smart about it. I hope this answers. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any further questions, so I give the floor to Sandrine. Thank you, Constance. So, first of all, I, I'm happy to, to celebrate uh, as each year the, the Data Privacy Day event, if it's on, on remote um, format. And when, when we began to prepare this session about the Data Privacy Day, I, I thought from a research perspective. And I say, what I will um, what I can explore today with you in relation with research and data protection. And I think I, I will focus my speech on the challenges of uh, research and um, the evolving uh, data protection um, regulation. So I will, I will come back to, to, to the conception of the research in the GDPR that is a broad uh, conception. In the GDPR and also in practice, the research is fundamental and applied research. It's also, and we are speaking uh, a lot of it, research involving technological development, including artificial intelligence. You also have different stakeholders like um, the public stakeholders, the, the research that is uh, privately funded. You also have in the context of the pandemic, research conducted in the public interest, especially for in the area of public health with the research of, of COVID. And at the European level, the governance and the policy of research is clearly in the favor of sharing. We know the open air, the European Science Cloud, the Data Governance Act that uh, uh, the commissioner of the CNPD, uh, Mark Lemmer, will, will um, detail more. And also the initiative that will come in, um, in consequences of the Data Governance Act, that is the Luxembourg National Platform of Exchange Project. So there is this balance between uh, the data protection in research, between the processing and the sharing in research, and in compliance with the GDPR, the e-privacy, and the new regulation that will come like the Data Governance Act and the Artificial Intelligence Act. So. My, my, uh, my issue today, my, my, my question is how to combine these different elements. There are, as you know, some challenges and pitfalls for research in a GDPR and data protection perspective, but we have to, to keep calm and to continue our efforts. So I want today to focus on some um, challenges for research in a data protection perspective and in this um, data protection uh, regulation, um, I would say, uh, shifting and evolving landscape. Because we know that we have 
we have these regulations of the GDPR, and since, since the entry to force of this um, regulation, we have guidelines from the EDPB about the different interpretation of the key pillar of the GDPR, and also we have a uh, case court and recommendation in front from the Data Protection Authority. So I would focus uh, on some pieces uh, on a, in a context of research. The first thing that I, 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 I meet um, regularly is to identify personal data in research. It's not easy always because the definition of personal data is large and the data, the personal data in research is various. So, for example, we have in research, we process various data sets with direct identifier, name, surname, so on, and also indirect identifiers like uh, the composition of the household, the income, the nationality, so on and so forth to conduct study. We also process regular personal data and also sensitive data. Sensitive data like uh, in the sector of the health research, health data, also some um, studies about sexual orientation, ethnic origin. So we have also to deal with this. In research, there is also the use of pseudonyms. So pseudonyms is personal data. And we have also combination and analysis of different data sets for data sets for, from indirect and direct collections. And uh, in relation with this, it's regularly necessary to clarify pseudonymization and anonymization. And we can say that we also have um, discussion, I would say, between partners, depending on the, on the um, geographical location. Because, for example, in research, we have some debates about the notion of pseudonymous or anonymous data. For example, we do not consider uh, the same way uh, with UK or United States about the, the pseudonymous or anonymous data. So pseudonymization is privileged in research, I would say, and uh, but we do not have really, we have the interpretation, uh, we, we have the interpretation of the GDPR, we have the practice, but we do not have guidelines from urban data protection authorities about pseudonymization. At the moment, we do not have a national third trust party but we, we hope that we will have uh, soon, and we already have some organism, even if there is not national law. For anonymization, I would say that we have an old guidance from 2014, even if the technologies evolve a lot. And um, my advice is really in research, it is feasible to privilege anonymization. But anonymization is not always possible. And for some fields of research, it's impossible, like, for example, health research, genetic analysis. But to, to, to come back to the notion of personal data, I, 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 I like this because pseudonymous data is personal data, anonymous data is not personal data. Another challenge, and uh, I'm happy to see that we will have a soon guidelines of uh, the European Data Protection Board is the right of access. And there, there, is, um, there were um, last week a publication of the EDPB about uh, the, the, the consultation and publication soon of guidelines about the right of access to clarify the scope, the information that must provide it, the format also of the access rights, the modalities, and um, the clarification of what is uh, a request from data subject that are encoded or excessive. So what are her interrogation in relation with the right of access from a perspective of research is the clarification of the scope. Sometime we have to assess and we hope that this um, guideline will clarify uh, what about the data that are produced by the research activities and other, um, other concerns like confidentiality and intellectual property. So uh, I think the clarification of the scope of the right of access in addition of the provision of, of the GDPR would be helpful. The, the other piece is, is uh, which information must be provided to the data subject and how to chase ambig ambiguous answers. So as the EDPB um, already uh, always provide example, that would be interesting to, to, um, 
to have example of uh, the exercise of rights of access, how to do properly, and also um, we will also participate to the consultation to to also raise the point from a research perspective. The format of access is also a question because we we, we are wondering which electronic means, means will be accepted. And also, uh, we, we did not already face, but what is a request that is man manifestly unfunded or excessive? So I think these future guidelines about the exercise of uh, one of the, the most exercised data subjects will be very useful. In research, we have another, um, another challenges that is in relation with international transfer, because as I say, um, the last, uh, during the last section of the Data Privacy Day, the science and research have no borders. We have multiple collaboration in different ways with other um, actors of, of the research outside European Union and EEA. That is the, the same with uh, the application solution services because the research is here to, to research, to innovate. So there is no borders. So now we, we, we got a recent um, guideline from European Data Protection Board that clarify the notion of international transfer. So there, there were three criteria that has to be accumulated and afterward I will, I will share with you my, my, my thoughts about this, this uh, criteria in the context of research. So the first criteria is that the data exporter must be submitted to the GDPR for the processing given. So if we have, um, for example, the University of Luxembourg that is located in, um, in, in, in European Union, and we want to share or to transfer, to disclose data to uh, a university in Australia, for example, it's easy because we apply the international rules of, of transfer of personal data. The question is less easy when the processing um, takes place outside the European Union and um, the, the EDPB guidance is clear, even if the processing for um, an European institution takes place outside the European Union, we apply the international transfer rule. The situation is less easy when you have application of these rules for an institution that is um, located outside the European Union because the interpretation is quite extensive also in a sense to protect individuals. And um, so that is the, the, the three criteria about the international transfer. If, uh, what does it mean that the data exporter is submitted to the GDPR for this processing given? So we have, as I explained, the criteria of the establishment. You have um, the criteria of the data subject that is, uh, uh, that is in the EU. I will not detail because it's not really in the context of research. And you have another criteria. So you, if you fall under one of these criteria, you have to apply the international uh, rules of transfer. And you have the criteria of the monitoring of the behavior. And I think the EDPB gave um, an interesting example about an health and lifestyle, lifestyle application that was developed by a US company as that is possible for the users of the application that are in Europe to, um, to record indicators like the sleep time, for example, the application that is making available to individual in the EU, in the EU so the US company has to apply the GDPR. So I would say there are also other criteria. The, the other criteria is that um, it's necessary if we apply the, the international transfer rule that there is a disclosure. There is a disclosure by transmission or otherwise making data available to another institution. And I will explain my, my thoughts in relation with the research. And the third criteria is that the data importer must be located in a third country or is an international organization. What is more um, a surprise for us is that, uh, that we understand the point is that if there is a data subject, a user of an application, for example, that um, directly um, send the data to uh, a company that is located outside the European Union, 
the international transfer rule does not apply. So we have some thoughts about this, um, this um, international transfer rules and interpretation of the EDPB. First thing is how can we interpret the, the disclosure and the second factor that is otherwise making data available to another institution? Because the example provided uh, mentioned sending and providing, but we are wondering if we give access to a database that is located in the European Union to an institution that is located outside the European Union, does this international transfer rule apply or not? We don't, we don't know, and we, we, we did not find uh, the, the answer. And uh, another uh, more, more difficult topic is also how an institution that is located outside the European Union that, that have an establishment or a link in the, in the EU will apply the rule about international transfer. And for us, it's important also in, the, um, in relation with our collaboration with different partners that are located outside the European Union. I want also to, to finish my presentation about the, the recent um, regulation initiative at European level that will be developed by uh, also be touched by Mark Lemmer later on. It's uh, the Data Governance Act and the Artificial Intelligence Act because they are clearly relationship with the research. So this, uh, I would just uh, give an overview of uh, some points of the data, data Governance Act, because that is in the meaning of, uh, in the sense of the sharing of the data, including personal data. And as I say at the beginning of my presentation, uh, in research, uh, the sharing of data is one of the, of the key points. So I saw that in December last year, there, there is a provisional agreement between European Council and Parliament about this act. So I, we presume that it will be adopted in the coming months. What is interesting, I think, to, to fill in a gap, if there is, um, that is in, in the sense of the wide reuse of certain type of protected public sector data. I think for some research, um, especially in socioeconomic research, but not only, they, they were necessary to have a legal basis to, to have um, a lawful um, exploitation of uh, public data. So I think uh, I get that this uh, act will, will constitute this uh, legal basis. And for sure, the personal data will be protected. So we will be interesting in the coming months between the, for, for the coordination of the different texts, GDPR and the Data Governance Act. And also the European Commission, perhaps uh, our speaker later on can also give more uh, elements about this, will we'll set up uh, an electronic register of public sector data and there will be the, a, con a national contact point. And we will also have a future initiative in Luxembourg. And we are very interesting and uh, curious about this initiative. This Data Governance Act also introduced the notion of data altruism for the common good. This one is new and uh, it's, um, it's interesting. Um, there is the example of medical research and the different studies that are conducted for general interest that, uh, and the different um, organization may apply to um, a national register of recognized data altru altruism organization. And that will allow, and uh, that will also encourage, we hope, to, to individuals to donate data to this organization in a regulated and safe way. So we are curious how all this will be implemented in the respect for sure of the data protection regulation. Uh, the other uh, very interesting act is the Data Artificial Intelligence Act. So I will just give some elements about this. So there is in, the, in this draft, there is an attempt to, to, to define this AA and to differentiate from other technologies. And there is like the GDPR, a wide scope of application. Because even if the, the, the institution that will um, constitute the AA will give output in the system in the UA, this act, uh, will apply. So that is, um, I think, the same philosophy than in the GDPR, 
where the GDPR can also apply with to some companies that are located outside European Union, but ha have a link with European Union or monitor or sell goods or services to European citizens. And what is very interesting, like the philosophy of the GDPR, is that in the Artificial Intelligence Act draft, there is also a risk-based approach. There is a classification of the activity, AA activity that are uh, high, high, high risk, represent high risk, low risk, and are unacceptable. So in the unacceptable risk activity, we can find the social scoring, for example. For the high risk activity of artificial intelligence, we also find the medical devices, the biometric system, and also on the side of um, education and vocational training. So there is a complete annex with this classification of activity that are unacceptable or I represent high risk. And there is also the low activities like the chatbot. So some other element about this very interesting act is that there is for sure legal requirement for high risk AA. And that is where we can also find the link with the data protection regulation, because there, there is a requirement of transparency and information of users that is especially necessary in the context of AI, of security as well. And I also read that there are specific guidelines, ethic guidelines, very recognized that are also uh, taken at reference to introduce rule in this draft act. What is also seems to be is that the activity that are not mentioned in this act seems to be at minimal risk and not regulated by this act. The last question that I would have is that for the purpose of scientific research, we do not know at the moment if the Artificial Intelligence and Act include the, the, the AI done for research. I read in a very interesting and famous article that it was not included, but I'm not sure about this, and I, I get that uh, that would be interesting to, 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 to have more information about uh, the scope. So that was what I wanted to share uh, with you in, in the context of this evolution of data protection world and and the research so i really wanted to focus on some points because we have a lot of um, a lot of uh, questions and answer to 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 bring so i hope that uh, that gave i gave you an overview and uh, now if you have any question feel free to to ask within the chat thank you very much for your attention thank you very much uh so um, please put your questions in the chat. I actually have a question. So uh, something, if you are a researcher and you are, have a, a doubt about data protection, um, where is the play? Where's the best place to get all the information that you just presented to us in a compiled version? Uh, Constant, could could you repeat uh, your, your question? Because so, if you are a researcher at the university doing your research and you wonder about data protection and you have a doubt, where is the place where you can get all this information uh, in an in an overview? Ah, yes, we 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 we, we provide uh, information through the different tools of the university from the data protection office, and we also have a network of contact person. So it's uh, it's the office the researcher should always get in touch with when they have a lot. Yes, doubt. and we also have information on the website. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So I don't see any further questions. Please do not um, hesitate if you have questions at a later stage to ask them in the chat. Since I do not see any further questions. Thank you for having me today. And uh, exactly, that's a, a very good transition because during the next. 30 minutes or so, we will discuss about cookies, HTTP cookies used on the internet. And maybe at the end, I will try to also uh, provide a part of, of the answer to that question that was uh, just uh, uh, raised now. Cookies affect everyone. But did you ever ask yourself, what are cookies exactly? What is the current legal framework and does it apply to me? What is in the guidelines from the National Supervisory Authority in Luxembourg, the CNPD? What 
are the legal requirements. And last but not least, why would this be important for my business? With my ICT, IP, media, and data protection team at Having a Host, this is the type of questions we deal with for clients requesting a legal review of their online presence. Such review implies drafting, reviewing, updating the terms and conditions applying to websites, including data protection notices, cookie policies, and cookie banners. So let's start with the beginning. What exactly are HTTP cookies. The name cookie originates from the term magic cookies that derives from a fortune cookie. A fortune cookie is a crisp and sugary cookie with a piece of paper inside, a fortune, usually an aphorism or a vague prophecy. In computer science, a cookie is a piece of code with an embedded message. In fact, it is simply a small bit of information that travels from a web browser or an application on a computer or mobile device to a web server. Cookies are there to track web and app activities and keep browsing histories. They can recognize a visitor and record which type of device and browser they use, which web page they are coming from, what they look for, how much time they stay on a web page, where they click on, etc., etc. This can benefit the visitor, of course, but websites get a lot out of this as well. There are other tracking technologies similar to cookies, such as fingerprints, pixel, or web beacons. The same regime applies to those, since they all purport, purport to store and collect device information. So I will gather all of them under the term cookie. Cookies can be set by, by the website you visit which is then the only one who can read the information. But a website can also use external services, which can set their own cookies, so-called third-party cookies. From a technical perspective, there are many two types of cookies. Session cookies, they are only used during the time you navigate on a website. They are deleted once you leave the website. Whereas to the contrary, persistent cookies remain on the computer for a certain period of time, or even sometimes indefinitely, meaning that they are not automatically deleted from the computer. Cookies may have different functions. They can recall user login or preferences. They can personalize the content of a website according to those preferences or the web activity. They can run analytics. And all of these functions may be used for various purposes. Some cookies are not very intrusive in terms of privacy. They remember your language choice so that you do not have to choose the language each time you come back to the website. Or they ensure the website runs correctly. For example, by allowing to continue shopping on a marketplace while the shopping basket keeps the items in it, even if you leave that page. Or by avoiding ever to having to re-enter login information on every new page visited. They can improve the website performances or content, but there are also other cookies that may have more implications in terms of privacy, such as, for example, those 
allowing to provide targeted advertising. We've all seen ads on a website or in our emails for items similar to those we've just searched for on another website. Did this raise your eyebrows? I will come back on the categorization of cookies, but there's one important point I would like to make about cookies before we continue. If you, as an EU entity, use a website or application as a communication tool for your business, any type of business, in any industry or sector, including by simply integrating the social plugin of a third party, your use of cookies falls within the scope of the applicable rules. There is no exception or threshold for these rules to apply. Let's then have a closer look at what, at what these rules are and what they say. In 2002, 2002, that was 20 years ago, to put things into context, the World Wide Web started to be well known in, to the general public in 1996. And Steve Jobs unveiled the first iPhone in January 2009. At the time, I think that no one was really caring about the privacy aspects of cookies. No one? Well, in 2002, the EU adopts the e-privacy directive, also known as the EU cookie law, because it was the first piece of legislation to regulate the use of trackers, web bugs, hidden identifiers, and other similar devices for entering user terminal to gain access to information, to store hidden information, or to trace the activities of the user. This principle-based legislation at the time already says that storing and accessing information stored in the terminal equipment of a user is only possible if the user receives clear and comprehensive information and is offered the right to refuse such processing by the data controller. But the legislation also says already that today that this shall not prevent technical storage or access strictly necessary to provide a service explicitly requested by the user. That said, an EU directive needs to be implemented in all member states. This resulted in variable implementation throughout the EU. That's why, more recently, in 2017, the European Commission proposed an e-privacy regulation. A regulation, by contrast to a directive, is directly applicable in all member states, and therefore it allows for better harmonizations, harmonization of the rules throughout the EU. That regulation or draft regulation was supposed to enter into application together with the GDPR, but it is still under discussion today. One of the reasons is probably the enormous stakes in online advertising. The GDPR came into application on, in May 2018 the GDPR as such does not regulate cookies, but its entry into application had consequences and the consent referred to in the e-privacy directive and about which I will talk in a moment. Because consent must now be construed in the light of the GDPR. In 2019, the judgment of the Court of Justice of the European Union in the Planet 49 case specified, if need be, 
that consent must result from a clear affirmative action. We will come back on that and consent in a moment, but I would also like to draw your attention to the guidelines on consent from the EDPB. That's 33 pages exclusively speaking on the concept of consent. So 30 minutes would not be enough to speak about consent alone. <clears throat> In terms of future developments, last year, the Permanent Representative Committee of the European Union received a mandate for negotiating an update of the e-privacy directive of 2002. That update is needed to cater for new technological and market developments. Notably because users' terminal equipment, such as the smartphone we all have in our pocket, may nowadays store a big amount of highly personal information. It's also needed to provide users with a genuine choice while avoiding cookie consent fatigue, which we probably all experience every day. And last but not least, the main reason why we are talking about cookies today, the publication of guidelines on cookies by the CNPD at the end of last year, which was already raised uh, in the previous presentation. Published in October last year, the guidelines provide a definition of cookies and similar technologies. They also provide details about the legal framework and the applicable principles, which I will summarize on my next slide. Above all, it contains practical guidance, as well as examples of good and bad behaviors. As introduced by Mr. Lemmer, the CNPD also published a practical guide of eight pages this morning, including at the end a decision tree, also summarizing the main requirements. Based on the law, the guidelines, and these examples, one thing appears quite evident. Ready-to-use cookie banners aren't necessarily compliant per se. So, what does the law and the CNPD say? From a legal perspective, cookies may be classified in two categories. Essential cookies, also called functional cookies, are cookies that are strictly necessary for the website or application to run properly. Examples include cookies to store your cookie preferences, login information, shopping basket items, security information, and the like. The other categories is non-essential non cookies, such as those used for analytics. The key legal requirements in relation to those two categories can be summarized as follows. The use of any type of cookie, essential and non-essential, require that users be informed about their existence. What is the type of cookie? What is its purpose? For how much time will, be, will it be stored on the computer? And if third parties receive data, where these parties are located? And to maybe partially answer the question that was raised at the end of the previous presentation. What we are looking at today are the rules relating to the setting up 
of cookies. Of course, if the cookies collect and process personal data, the GDPR as a whole applied to this processing of personal data, meaning that if a cookie is there that also transfers personal data to an entity outside of the European economic area, the rules on transfers will apply on top of the fact that a cookie is set on the user's computer or application. The information must be concise, transparent, intelligible, and easily accessible. It must be provided in a clear and plain language. In addition, non-essential cookies, such as those used for analytics, require the consent of the user. And valid consent is not easy to obtain, as it must be free, specific, informed, and unambiguous. Remember the Planet 49 case talking about clear affirmative action? It means, for example, that pre-ticked boxes are not allowed. It also means that silence does not equal consent. So until the user has made a choice, you're not allowed, actually, to set any non-essential cookie. Consent uh, is a complex matter, as I just said, and for cookies, it must be as easy to refuse as to give consent. Also, users must be able to waive consent at any time without justification. In my experience, very few websites, however, allow you to come back to your cookie settings if you made a mistake that's too late. Ideally, consent should be renewed after a certain period of time, for example, 12 months. This is only a summary of the applicable rules. Each type of situation should be analyzed specifically. The following are only dummy cookie banners to illustrate the concept and above all, show how compliance can lead to confidence. I think these examples that you see on the screen right now are self-explanatory. As a user, I personally find the one on the right-hand side particularly misleading and annoying. When I come across similar cookie banners, generally, I run away from that website. That type of cookie banner, the right-hand side of the slide now, to the contrary, seems fairer to me and aims at providing users with a genuine choice, which cookie banner on this slide, do you think provides confidence in the company that runs the website or the application? And confidence is key for your business, isn't it? So the banner on the far right provides for clear information on the fact that cookies are used and how to access more detailed information about that. It also provides the option to accept or reject all cookies at once. And refusing seems as easy as accepting. It also provides an easy option to only accept essential cookies. Underneath, 
there is a personalization panel with a clear display of the types of cookies that are used and a genuine choice can be made in respect of each of the categories of cookies, not all the providers or all the cookies that might appear on the website. And there is a clear button to save my choices. That said, this one is only for illustration. And a nice cookie banner is not sufficient. You need to provide the right information. And on top of that, make sure that your website or application behaves as you say. Often, clients come to us asking for confirmation that their cookie policy conforms to the legislation. What we do generally is that we test the website and quite often we saw cookies stored on our computer even before we've been able to make any choice. Even if the cookie policy says that no cookies are stored before a choice has been made. On top of that, the internet has no borders. If you target users in other countries outside of the EEA, make sure to look after local laws and regulation. Lawmakers in other countries start adopting GDPR-like regulations, including, for example, in California, Brazil, and China. <clears throat> Carefully considering cookie laws is important above all because one needs to realize that cookies are a means of accessing data on a computer. Accessing data stored on someone's computer or mobile device without the user being informed could be deemed equivalent to hacking or theft of information and personal data. Well, it's also important because users and also the authorities look at it more and more seriously. It was alluded in a question, the Austrian Data Protection Authority decided on December 22 last year that the transfer of personal data, IP address and other cookie data in this case, to Google by an Austrian company acting as controller responsible for the implementation of Google Analytics and related cookies was illegal as it violated the Schrems II decision relating to complementary measures. That is, standard clauses alone did not offer, in that case, a sufficient level of protection as the data importer is, according to the Austrian Data Protection Authority, subject to surveillance by local law enforcement agencies. In France, between 2020 and 2021, the CNIL adopted more than 70 measures, orders and sanctions regarding illegal cookies alone. Recently, the CNIL issued fine against Google for a total amount of 150 million euros and against Facebook for 60 million euros because users couldn't refuse cookies as easily as to accept them on YouTube and on Facebook. In Luxembourg, in 2021, the CNPD imposed fines on 16 companies, focusing mainly on DPO and video surveillance. Will cookies come next? 
As you are interested by data protection and certainly other related technology topics that we cover from a legal perspective, I invite you to visit our website at alvingeros.lu, where we regularly publish news items. Um, you can also register to receive our dedicated uh, newsletter. Last advice for today, don't eat too much sugary cookies. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Gary. That was a really nice ending. And I um, ask you if you have questions, please put them in the chat. There is one comment on a study on the transparency of cookie banners. Um, um, some um, participant has shared on the chat. I do not see any uh, questions at the moment. So I um, propose um, that we break for, lunch, uh, for a short break, a coffee break, and then we will continue in half an hour at 11.30 with the next presentation. Thank you very much and see you later. Ma chers amis, bonjour. Uh, tout d'abord, je remercie uh, les organisateurs de me permettre d'être uh, un des orateurs de cette matinée. J'exerce la fonction de DPO au sein de Servior, qui est le leader national dans l'accompagnement et la prise en charge globale de la personne âgée. En préambule, je veux vous dire quel DPO je suis. Donc, comme vous le savez, c'est le RGPD qui a introduit cette nouvelle fonction et le DPO est devenu la figure du RGPD garant de sa conformité dans les établissements, organisations et entreprises. Mais surtout, celui qui est porteur d'une ambition, celle de défendre le droit des individus. C'est pourquoi je considère l'indépendance euh, dont bénéficie le DPO qui doit lui permettre de sensibiliser et surtout d'influencer un mouvement vers un nouveau paradigme. C'est pourquoi je souhaite contribuer pleinement et entièrement à la réalisation de cet idéal qui va au-delà du contrôle de la conformité du RGPD au sein de mon organisation. Donc, en effet, les libertés et les droits fondamentaux priment sur nos propres intérêts au sein de nos organisations. Il convient alors de communiquer et promouvoir les solutions à mettre en œuvre, à mettre en avant pour atteindre cet idéal commun dont la réussite passe par une expression collective plus énergique et plus active. Donc aujourd'hui, mon sujet, le logiciel libre solution numérique éthique de conformité RGPD se déclinera en quatre points. D'abord, il y aura un constat sur les tendances concernant le traitement actuel des données, une vision personnelle, puis des solutions par rapport aux tendances actuelles avec un zoom particulier sur le logiciel libre et comment concrètement on peut l'appliquer, enfin, en tout cas les entreprises peuvent l'appliquer dans dans leur développement et leur quotidien. Mais avant de commencer, j'aimerais poser la question à, à l'auditoire. Qui parmi vous sait ce qu'est le logiciel libre Alors, Ceux qui savent peuvent lever la main. La moitié, on va dire, des participants. Et parmi ceux qui savent, qu'est-ce que le logiciel libre qui est favorable. Un petit peu moins que, la, que les 50%. Donc, je reposerai la question à la fin de mon intervention. Donc, mon, mon, mon sujet, le logiciel libre solution numérique éthique de conformité RGPD, sera donc un éclairage, non pas d'un point de vue légal, mais d'un point de vue technologique à savoir comment la technologie est une réponse concrète à la finalité et aux aspirations 
euh, de l'Union européenne induit par le RGP2. En effet, chers amis, je vous sais bien informé, vous connaissez tous l'objectif principal du RGPD, dont le but est d'augmenter la protection des utilisateurs en matière de données personnelles. Mais connaissez-vous la finalité et les aspirations de l'Europe en introduisant le RGPD La réponse est idéologique. Pourquoi Car l'Union européenne n'a aucune influence dans l'industrie numérique. Alors l'Union européenne bah, compte y remédier. Elle compte retrouver non pas un leadership d'antan, mais au moins une influence d'abord en termes idéologiques, celui de reprendre le contrôle des données. Puis éventuellement, une influence industrielle en rattrapant son retard technologique, ce qui lui permettra de, con conquér euh, de conquérir une souveraineté numérique et par voie de conséquence une souveraineté européenne puis nationale pour chacun de ses membres. Donc, ce sursaut, ce rebond repose sur le RGPD. Ayez bien conscience que le RGPD est un acte fort, car le droit des individus prime sur sa dépendance à une nationalité ou à la localisation de ses données. Depuis son introduction, l'Europe est devenue alors une figure de, de proue mondiale qui permet de mettre l'Europe au centre du débat. Dans un monde qui se digitalise, en promouvant des valeurs chères aux citoyens européens, telles que les valeurs de protection, d'information et d'éthique, qui positionnent donc l'Europe à l'avant-garde d'un débat devenu planétaire. Passons à présent sur quelles sont les tendances dans le traitement actuel de nos données personnelles. Avant d'exposer une vision et des solutions, notamment celle du logiciel libre, il convient de poser le constat sur la manière dont sont traitées actuellement nos données personnelles. Je ferai trois constats. Le premier constat, je constate que l'Union européenne est paradoxale et contradictoire dans son ambition et ses intentions, car elle opte pour des, des alliances avec les, les GAFAM à un niveau de dépendance fort en externalisant les services informatiques et en privilégiant des solutions propriétaires. Cette stratégie est impulsée par des décideurs politiques entretenant justement une relation parfois de complaisance avec les GAFA. En tant que citoyen européen, je vous interpelle, voulez-vous choisir entre la dépendance à des acteurs non européens ou à l'autonomie pleine et entière de l'Union européenne Deuxième constat, je constate l'abus de la base légale intérêt légitime dans le traitement de données par un calculateur ou une puce informatique que nous pouvons retrouver sur un ordinateur ou les smartphones. En effet, rien n'empêche une surveillance de masse mondiale sournoise de la part des manufacturiers des systèmes d'information hardware et software. Il y a des backdoors, donc des portes dérobées, qui sont en quelque sorte comme si vous invitez quelqu'un à manger à votre table et il soit au courant de tout. Donc, il accède à vos données en fonction de vos intérêts et il exploite sans avoir à demander votre consentement. En tant que citoyen européen, je vous interpelle, voulez-vous choisir entre l'opacité et la transparence Troisième constat, je constate que l'Europe ou l'Union européenne est prise dans une tenaille sino-américaine, avec d'un côté des sociétés américaines qui accumulent des données considérées comme une propriété euh, privée, au même titre qu'une voiture, une maison, qui sont sujettes à monétisation, à commerce, et peuvent être donc euh, vendues. Et de l'autre, un régime euh, chinois qui accumule des outils de contrôle et d'ingénierie de plus en plus, d'ingénierie sociale de plus en plus inquiétant. En effet, la Chine a une doctrine forte et assume de, for de manière décomplexée sa, sa volonté de contrôler les individus composant sa, popula sa population par le crédit social. Et puis demain, pour établir une cartographie génétique. Aujourd'hui, le crédit social utilise le numérique et la digitalisation pour organiser et identifier les comportements afin d'harmoniser 
harmoniser l'ensemble de la communauté, mais surtout, surtout d'asservir son peuple pour éteindre une toute forme de contestation, de revendication ou pour cibler les minorités ethniques et religieuses. C'est pour ça, en tant que citoyen européen, je vous interpelle, voulez-vous choisir entre la Chine, où l'État organise la société et où l'individu devient un pion, les États-Unis, où nous sommes qu'une feuille Excel et nous vivons dans un espace commercial permanent, ou choisir une troisième voie plus libre. J'ajouterai un quatrième constat pour finir, car disons-le franchement, il apparaît de manière insidieuse dans certains pays un basculement, un risque qui va au-delà de la sphère économique ou des politiques, des politiques modestement armées d'un point de vue moral seraient tentées d'avoir une influence absolue sur les individus par l'impulsion déterminée et énergique de la digitalisation pour toute action des marches dans nos vies. Alors, je vais vous partager ma vision hein, par voie de conséquence de ces tendances. Eh bien, la protection de la vie privée est aujourd'hui euh, bafouée et peut-être absente demain. Sans protection de la vie privée, il est impossible d'en user. Donc, il est aisé de conclure que la protection des données est sans cesse un défi aux quatre coins du monde face à des intentions dissimulées ou ostensibles d'origine politique ou économique pour surveiller les individus. Or, la surveillance des individus favorise mieux le contrôle et, de facto, leur liberté. Cependant, la liberté des individus est plus importante que l'asservissement à un régime ou à la liberté des, des entreprises. En ce sens, je suis partisan d'un projet de société où les individus doivent retrouver les valeurs de la Déclaration des droits de l'homme, celle de la liberté des individus, et rappeler à leurs États, parfois défaillants, que leur mission est de protéger les citoyens du futur et non de les contraindre ou de les vendre au mieux disant ou au plus offrant. La finalité de ce projet est de permettre aux citoyens de reprendre le contrôle total de leurs données. Donc chaque institution démocratique européenne ne doit plus tergiverser mais agir par des actes. Donc la place n'est plus à la communication ou aux luttes intestine, interne ou encore à l'influence des lobbyistes ne représentant pas l'intérêt des individus. Les individus ne pourront pas être libres s'il n'existe pas une éthique et une pratique stricte de ce à quoi les individus aspirent. Il convient encore et encore de lutter contre la surveillance de masse, interdire le micro-ciblage et refuser que les données des citoyens soient exfiltrés dans des entreprises privées qui sont les bras armés de gouvernements extérieurs ou autres. Mais arrivent bien sûr les solutions. Alors, quelques, quelles solutions pour une souveraineté numérique en Europe Il y, en a, il y a encore beaucoup à, beaucoup à faire, mais disons-le, disons rêvons d'une Europe qui construit en, trois, en cinq ans un monde numérique dans lequel nous voulons vivre. Il s'agit de permettre aux citoyens, ou plutôt il s'agit de nous permettre, de reprendre le plein contrôle de nos données. C'est pourquoi, parmi les suggestions issues du monde de la résistance, j'en promeux quatre. La première, prendre clairement position pour une Europe numérique éthique, autonome et indépendante, sans la contribution d'acteurs non européens. En fait, c'est implémenter une vision éthique qui soit conforme aux valeurs européennes, remettre l'humain au centre de la, de la décision, sanctuariser la vie privée et égaliser euh, les traitements des citoyens sans algorithme discriminant. Donc, c'est mettre en place cette souveraineté des individus. Deuxième solution, impulser et coordonner la stratégie par la nomination d'un d'un chief technology officer égal d'un chef des armées qui définirait l'architecture d'une Europe souveraine, cohérente et résiliente par le volet numérique. Troisième solution, c'est rapatrier nos nombreux euh, ingénieurs de talent qui sont partis outre-Atlantique, par exemple, et bien sûr retenir euh, les, les, nos futurs talents. Quatrième point, qui est donc le sujet aussi du jour, 
c'est soutenir massivement euh, les logiciels libres, choisir des technologies qui libèrent contre des technologies qui surveillent et contrôlent. C'est un objectif d'une société plus égalitaire en raison de son caractère universel. Alors, pourquoi Déjà, pour comprendre, faisons un voyage dans le temps en montant dans la DeLorean. Dans les années 1950, à l'époque des premiers ordinateurs, c'était les balbutiements de l'informatique. Il y avait tout à faire, tout à développer. Les hackers étaient des passionnés qui voulaient comprendre le fonctionnement interne des ordinateurs et du réseau. C'était des bidouilleurs, des bricoleurs créatifs. Cependant, ils voyaient dans ce nouvel outil un moyen de s'émanciper et l'opportunité de créer une nouvelle société plus égalitaire, libérée des hiérarchies et de la bureaucratie en partageant les connaissances et en les améliorant ensemble. Cette philosophie se nomme la contre-culture californienne. D'autant plus qu'il y avait un échange de bons procédés entre les constructeurs des premiers ordinateurs et les programmeurs. En effet, la vente du matériel informatique était fa facilitée et favorisée car la partie logicielle était en accès libre, ce qui permettait de valoriser et promouvoir les ordinateurs. L'accès donc au code source était donc normal car nul n'achetait un ordinateur sans disposer d'une équipe de programmeurs. Les milieux professionnels et universitaires s'échangeaient donc volontiers euh, logiciels et codes sources sans droit d'auteur jusqu'à ce que la justice ne l'interdise au début des années 70 par les lois antitrust afin de permettre l'exercice d'une concurrence dans ce domaine. Ce faisant, donc les constructeurs sont contraints de facturer séparément le matériel et le logiciel. Ce modèle se, se développe rapidement avec l'apparition de l'ordinateur personnel, ou ce que l'on appelle aussi le micro-informatique. Ça entraîne un essor euh, des éditeurs de logiciels qui se rémunèrent sur les licences d'utilisation de leur système. Pour illustrer donc, ce, ce basculement, 1976 est une année clé symbolique. Cette année-là, un tout jeune entrepreneur dénommé Bill Gates rédige une lettre ouverte aux amateurs, leur ordonnant de cesser de copier illicitement les logiciels en affirmant que les logiciels ne peuvent plus circuler gratuitement. Bill Gates donc va imposer la vente liée ou vente forcée, bien qu'interdite par la loi, qui consiste à nous vendre le logiciel en même temps que notre ordinateur, sans possibilité de les refuser. Dès lors, l'informatique va devenir un business et les entrepreneurs, les nouveaux pionniers. L'utopie de la contre-culture californienne laisse donc place à l'ultra-capitalisme. Parallèlement, les constructeurs vont restreindre l'accès aux codes source des logiciels. Il devient impossible et dans certains cas interdit d'étudier, de corriger ou d'améliorer les logiciels acquis. L'utilisateur ne peut plus adapter le logiciel à ses souhaits et, en cas de bug, il se retrouve dépendant du bon vouloir de l'éditeur. Enfin, la copie est une opération naturelle pour un ordinateur, devient là aussi une règle générale qui est interdite. Et les logiciels, disponibles uniquement sous ces conditions restrictives, deviennent alors la règle et les logiciels, jusqu'alors librement échangés, se retrouvent souvent intégrés dans des produits commerciaux figés et non partageables. Mais, j'ai envie de dire concrètement, pour éviter effectivement que, que ce monde-là soit régi au marché et qu'il y ait une hégémonie, euh, il faut effectivement zoomer sur soutenir massivement les logiciels libres pour plusieurs objectifs. La première, c'est ressusciter la philosophie originelle des hackers informatiques, à ne pas confondre avec les crackers qui, eux, exploitent les vulnérabilités. Les pirates, ce sont les crackers. 
Donc, ressusciter cette philosophie, c'est euh, donc revenir aux origines. La deuxième, c'est choisir les technologies qui libèrent, basées sur le partage des connaissances, l'ouverture, l'universalité, univers, les services décentralisés et le chiffrement point à point. Versus les technologies qui surveillent et contrôlent, basées quant à elles sur la centralisation. Donc, on peut le dire, c'est un objectif de société par son caractère universel. Faire confiance à des technologies fermées n'est pas compatible avec la démocratie et la maîtrise des systèmes d'information. Troisième objectif, effectivement, c'est connaître de A à Z les contenus hardware et software des systèmes d'information en livre ouvert. Je me tiens à rappeler, je tiens à rappeler la, la définition du logiciel libre qui offre quatre libertés aux utilisateurs. La première, c'est la liberté de copier et distribuer le logiciel à ses amis. Le deuxième, c'est le droit de l'utiliser pour tous les usages. Le troisième, c'est le droit de l'étudier pour connaître son fonctionnement. Et le quatrième, c'est le droit de le modifier pour l'améliorer. Mais concrètement, pour notre Europe, notre pays, quels seraient les avantages du logiciel libre comme alternative Faire du logiciel libre, c'est renforcer la souveraineté numérique et l'indépendance de l'Union européenne et de chaque pays membre. Faire le choix du logiciel libre, c'est économiser les droits de licence des logiciels propriétaires pour être investi dans le développement de logiciels libres et ouverts. Faire le choix du logiciel libre, c'est être indépendant d'un fournisseur particulier, car il permet d'encourager tout développeur à innover les fonctionnalités et les services des solutions logicielles. Faire le choix du logiciel libre, c'est développer des solutions communes pouvant être utilisées par toutes les administrations de l'Union européenne. De surcroît, le logiciel étant ouvert, chaque pays pourrait adapter le logiciel à ses propres besoins. Faire le choix du logiciel libre, c'est développer toute la chaîne du logiciel d'une ressource informatique. Du BIOS, donc la carte, la, la puce qui est dans, dans les smartphones, les PC, qui comprend du logiciel, jusqu'à l'OS, l'Operating System, et les, les applications. Donc, cet ensemble, si l'ensemble était euh, développé en logiciel libre, il permettrait aussi donc, de garantir une grande sécurité, notamment des données et de la vie privée. Car le code source à, le code source à tous apporte la connaissance. L'accessibilité à tous apporte la vigilance, l'expertise et l'audit de tous. De surcroît, donc, les attaques informatiques, les cyberattaques seraient fortement réduites. Et faire le choix du logiciel libre, c'est éviter que le logiciel soit infiltré de portes dérobé. Bref, faire le choix du logiciel libre, c'est une alternative promouvant la liberté, c'est une alternative éthique, c'est une alternative de souveraineté, c'est une alternative d'économie. Les logiciels libres seront pour longtemps une base nécessaire à la construction d'une informatique et au service de nous tous, utilisateurs, parce qu'ils peuvent être vérifiés et améliorés par tous, et non pas un outil de service qui, de ceux qui souhaitent nous asservir, nous contrôler ou nous dominer. Vous pouvez d'ailleurs dès à présent choisir des solutions éthiques, respectueuses des données, puis d'activer votre droit à la portabilité, selon le RGPD, pour transférer vos données vers de nouvelles technologies. C'est très simple. Nous sommes la solution vers un nouveau paradigme qui respecte le droit des individus. Il existe des alternatives. Diaspora, alternative à Facebook. Mastodon, alternative à Twitter. Et bien d'autres encore en allant sur le site opencloud.eu. J'en ai fini pour mon intervention. Et euh, bonne continuation. 
pour les, les, les futurs orateurs. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup pour cette intervention très intéressante. Et uh, je demande s'il y a des questions. Ah oui, il y a une question. Y a-t-il des alternatives pour Google Analytics? Euh, il en existe. Après, il faut... Euh... Moi, je ne veux pas trop faire de promotion, mais effectivement, il existe. Il faut chercher. Parfois, c'est difficile, effectivement, de, euh, de, sur les plateformes de, de recherche, des moteurs de recherche, de trouver des solutions. Mais il en existe. Elle, elle se développe. Euh, et dès qu'on le sait, il faut, faut le partager. Comme il existe aussi des, euh, des alternatives, c'est-à-dire qu'il existe aussi des, des smartphones qui protègent les données. Alors, certes, elles sont moins conviviales, hein, un peu plus robustes, mais il existe des marques qui protège les données complètement euh, en évitant effectivement qu'il y ait des, des, des portes dérobées. L'objectif aussi pour, pour l'Europe, c'est à un moment donné, c'est de construire à un moment donné eux-mêmes ces équipements, et notamment euh, les puces qui euh, effectivement sont le, euh, une des conséquences des, des, des surveillances de masse. Il y a une autre question. Est-ce qu'il y a la PDL contient des informations sur leur site pour ces initiatives? Pas à ma connaissance. Après, il y a une autre question. Mais je rebondis, c'est sur... vrai qu'il faut euh, entendre plus de voix qui, euh, qui parlent du logiciel libre ou qui euh, euh, partagent leur... Euh, d'utilisation d'applications euh, euh, concernant le logiciel libre. Euh, par exemple, il existe aussi une, appli une application, peut-être qui s'appelle Exodus ou quelque chose dans ce style, qui permet de savoir, lorsqu'on télécharge une application sur notre smartphone, de savoir préalablement quels sont les, euh, les traceurs euh, qui sont utilisés dans cette application et voir s'il n'y a pas euh, une exagération, effectivement, de, de l'utilisation de ces traceurs par l'application même. Il y a une autre question. Quel futur pour le rôle du DPO Comment va-t-il évoluer d'après vous bah, Le DPO, euh, au-delà de, comme je disais tout à l'heure, au-delà de, de s'assurer de la conformité euh, RGPD dans son organisation, euh, son rôle aussi, c'est euh, de, de promouvoir des solutions qui... Euh, à moyen terme, puisque les entreprises sont effectivement sur des, des, des développements qui sont déjà engagés, mais d'intégrer de plus en plus cette notion, par exemple, de, que j'évoque, de, de logiciels libres ou de choisir des applications, des, des outils, des équipements qui sont plus en conformité avec le RGPD. Euh, moi, par exemple, de, sur ma, mon expérience de DPO, euh, j'utilise une plateforme de conformité RGPD qui, est, qui est, passe par un éditeur européen. Je veux pas choisir, j'ai fait en sorte de ne pas choisir un éditeur américain, par exemple. Euh, J'essaye d'être dans l'esprit, l'esprit du RGPD et de, de cette volonté, de cette voie que, dans laquelle nous guide l'Europe pour euh, préserver euh, nos droits. Merci pour cette réponse. Je ne vois pas d'autres questions. Donc, um, um, I give the floor to the next speaker. Merci. The next speaker is Chris Pynchon. He is a trainer at Be Secure, and his presentation is about feeding the insatiable algorithm every day life in the age of data. So, Chris, you have the floor. Hi, everybody. Just. Can you hope everybody can hear fine? And is my screen sharing? Okay. Hi, everybody. So, yes, today I want to talk about the uh, algorithm, the insatiable algorithm, everyday life in the age of data. Um, 
as uh, we mentioned in the introduction, I am representing here B-Secure, which is the Safer Internet Center of Luxembourg and part of the Safer Internet Centers of the European Union. And currently, um, B-Secure runs campaigns every year, and the campa a campaign running this year is a thing called Super User, How Connected Are You? And the objective of uh, the Super User is to get people to reflect on their own daily, daily media consumption, okay? uh, to reflect on what they do online themselves. And it takes uh, the form of a series of questions. For example, after waking up, I immediately look at my phone to read messages, etc. And one needs to answer the questions. At the end of the questions, the questionnaire, it gives you an analysis of who you are. It gives you an analysis of what you do online, what you may want to change, et cetera, et cetera. So if you want to participate in this, you can go to that address, which is superuser.lu, and participate in that. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this, of course, is because much of what we do online is determined by algorithms. It's, and all of the data that we provide when we're doing these kind of activities online, the kind of activities that are mentioned in SuperUser, is data that is obviously taken away, uh, anal analyzed, and added to the grand uh, data about us. Okay. So I mentioned in the in the little write-up about this that previously, you know, uh, people were guided by the seasons. We we followed the seasons. We followed the rhythms of the seasons, until of course technology changed that. And technology has developed, the uh, electricity obviously changed that and meant that we no longer had to follow the seasons as such. Now, there's a chocolate cake, and you might be wondering why I'm showing you a picture of a chocolate cake. This is from a Be Secure school training. If you live in Luxembourg or, or you have children in the Luxembourgish school system, I'm sure they will have had a Be Secure training in the school. We go to every school in Luxembourg at certain ages to do uh, internet safety training. And I've been doing those trainings for nine years. And when I started, I began to notice a couple of things. We were talking about the internet, but the children, the youngsters, diff different age groups really didn't know how the internet functioned, what it was as an infrastructure. And we were talking about algorithms, but nobody knew what they were either. So it was very complicated to talk about these issues, which really the children didn't understand. So in 2007, as part of the school training, we introduced uh, an introduction to algorithms into the school training. And these are slides from that training. And we talked about the chef that wants to make a chocolate cake. And how does the chef make a chocolate cake? Well, they follow a recipe. A recipe takes some ingredients, has, a pro has some, uh, some tools, it has a process, and it throws out a result, much as an algorithm does uh, when, we, when we look at things on the, you know, when we look at, uh, when we're using technology, an algorithm does a sim similar thing. And it was just a way to try to get kids to understand that. We also featured uh, this person. Uh, if anybody knows who this person is, they can uh, mention in the, in the chat there. Um, this person was actually a, an engineer who worked on the Apollo 11 space mission. And what's in those books is the code that she wrote, which actually put the man on the moon back uh, on Apollo 11. So what we wanted to show by this that was that was that algorithms have tangible algorithms and code have tangible results. The tangible result in the recipe is you make a cake. The tangible result of the code it's written in those books was that Apollo 11 functioned and the man landed on the moon. And we always loved this because this was the woman who put the man on the moon. Oh, sorry, we'll go back to that. So in case you, anybody doesn't know, that's Margaret Hamilton, and she's so famous that she has a Lego figure um, indicating in the women in scientist things. But I want to talk to, about how those algorithms and the, the, uh, some of the, and the things the other speakers have been talking about previously affect us on a daily basis. So I'm going to talk about 
the, uh, something that I'm very interested in, and that's music. So that, that was me back in the day when I was young and rebellious, playing in my band. And I'm still playing music now. But the whole panorama around music has changed, and it's changed specifically because of algorithms. It's changed specifically because of social media, and it's been cha changed specifically because of the companies um, that run those platforms. Why has that happened? How has that happened? So here's an example from this week. I'm sure everybody is aware that uh, Spotify, which incidentally is one of the few European companies that has this kind of power and um, in the kind of fields we're talking about, has had this dispute where Neil Young uh, has said that he wanted his music to be removed from Spotify and unless Spotify stopped Joe Rogan, uh, most, you know, the biggest podcaster in the world, from, talking, uh, from spreading misinformation, primarily about COVID, but about other things as well. And um, he did that, and of course, Spotify have sided with Joe Rogan, their big star, and consequently, Neil Young's music has been removed from that platform. So there was an interesting article here which says Neil Young's bat bat battle with Spotify is principled and comfortable. And the article talks about it's comfortable, comfortable because Neil Young does not need Spotify. He does not need, the, he doesn't mean, need money and he doesn't need the platform of Spotify. But every other musician on the planet does need Spotify. Every other musician on the planet who is not in a big star status needs to use Spotify and needs to use the algorithmic platform of Spotify to be able to even begin to attempt to make a living out of that. So Spotify can effectively can control whether or not musicians will follow Neil Young's lead and has to be removed from the platform or not. But it's not going to happen because for the vast majority of musicians, they cannot afford to remove from a platform as powerful as Spotify. And it's not just Spotify, these are all the platforms that this happens on when people through whatever their interest or if they are investing in uh, using platforms, online platforms to make a living or to promote music or culture or something, they are absolutely subject again and again and again to the whims of those companies. Recently, YouTube changed its algorithm and uh, short videos became more, um, were, were, were featured more higher in the algorithmic role of um, of YouTube. Instagram features more people with faces or whatever it is. The thing is that these platforms keep changing and keep changing and people have to respond to them. Now back in 2017, you know, we were explaining to young people who, uh, what an algorithm was. Now, all of these people on Spot, uh, that are using Spotify or are using Instagram, they're talking about, in, about algorithms every day as part of their daily life. We would no longer need to be teaching what an algorithm is in, uh, in a training class for young people because they are very aware that TikTok and that Instagram and all of these platforms depend on algorithms for their process to function. And consequently, we behave according to the rules that the algorithm gives us if we wish to use those platforms in any way that it would be considered successful. And that changes the way we do things. A friend of mine uh, in the UK, Steve Lawson, is a very well-known bass player, and he, he's been writing a blog for a number of years because he was also one of the first people back in the day, like myself, we, who were... Um, People who were early adopters of social media and use social media to to promote uh, the kind of things that we were talking about, be it music or, in my case, online privacy and the, these kind of things. And he recently wrote this a post called "Keeping Your Soul in an Algorithmic World." In the post, he quoted 
this article. Um, this article is from a is a book extract from a person that's she's an online yoga trainer. And she says here, teaching yoga on social media means fighting with your ego every day, praying it doesn't eventually swell so large you turn into a blimp. It means checking, constantly checking. It means posting, constantly posting. It means creating, constantly creating, but always with the other person in mind, with your followership, riding shotgun. The follower begins to color your inner sight. It becomes hard to see yourself without them. It's hard to know yourself without them. It means constantly thinking of ways to do better, to do more than the other guy. It's a never-ending state of comparison. No amount of work is ever enough, and the idea of good enough becomes a fantastical myth. I don't think it's possible to work in social media without these feelings eventually rising to the surface. Frankly, I don't think you can engage with social media at all without eventually arriving on this page. I'm always reminding myself to question the internet, question social media, question the art of curating my digital avatar at the expense of understanding my actual identity. We're in a digital war and the mind is its battlefield. I think I expect my digital avatar to somehow be a better version of myself. I expect her to be better than me, than the me I embody in real life. Against my better judgment, I respect royal, royalty and expect hierarchy. I expect to be represented by who I hope to be rather than who I know myself to be. And I admire the avatars of those who pretend to be what feels just out of my reach. Steve himself talked about this, and I won't read all of this, but I would say here that the economics of social media push ever further towards an understanding of audiences as a massive crowd of faceless avatars who need understanding through metadata and out revenue matrices who can be reached through shared interests and the pages they've liked on Facebook. But if your tribe is small or strange or disparate or heterogeneous, or you just don't want to say hi to them, you'll need to look elsewhere to do the work to swim upstream, to divert energy and attention away from the social media waterfall. So this is the, the issue. People have to change their way of being to respond. Musicians want to make music, but they have to spend all of their time becoming uh, finding ways to promote through, to promote themselves, to promote their music through uh, the algorithmic structure of the platforms they are using. And this is one of the issues that many of the previous speakers have been talking about, about the cookie things, about, you know, uh, GDPR, et cetera, et cetera. But, and the European nature of it, and as the previous speaker pointed out, you know, do we have a European internet or a global internet? Do we have these things? Well, we may have these GDPR, we may have like the cookie things, whatever, whatever. but we, need, we are using primarily American, Chinese platforms to do so, and we are playing by their rules, regardless of whether we have um, local rules which uh, expect to be expect to be followed with with respect to data criteria, and the problem is those platforms, as we know, are all powerful. So some of those platforms are now going off into the metaverse, and of course we see more problems or the, you know societal societal problems already existing there. Uh, gamers that have seen the metaverse and they don't want to be there, but the problem is the massive power that the, that the tech companies wield. Will, may, will possibly force us into using those platforms. And the moment in which authorities and organizations begin to use those platforms to reach members of the public, then we're all subject yet again to the algorithmic use of that. Right now in Luxembourg today, there is a, a um, on Facebook, there is a discussion by, uh, from the medical community about, uh, about uh, COVID using that platform, using Facebook, okay, using those platforms. So as we continue to use these platforms, as we continue to use those, we, you know, we are subject to the rules and regulations, the algorithmic structure of those platforms. And if we do not resist, if we cannot resist using those platforms, then that will continue to influence who we are, what we do. Again, we see examples again and again of what algorithmic um, structures do. Typical fa racist face, face recognition software, things that are 
stopping people's jobs because the uh, software does not recognize the, a, in this case, a black driver, you know, because the algorithm has been programmed in a certain way. Um, not the only one, the, the union involved in this case has 35 other drivers who have had their registration with Uber terminated as mistakes with, the, with this software. It's calling for Uber to scrap the racist algorithm. Well, you know, is that likely to happen? Probably not. My favorite example recently, a motorist was fined after the CCTV confused his license plate with a woman's t-shirt. The guy's license plate is Nitta, and there's a lady walking in the street 120 miles away with Nitta written on her t-shirt, and then he gets a, a fine uh, for doing this. Again, the algorithm is choosing those things, passing them out. We are, and uh, we are depending on the algorithm to do that. Um, a researcher from the University of Sussex, Tanya Kent, uh, Tanya Kent, produced this interesting article on identity advertising and algorithmic targeting, or well, how not to target your, um, you know, how to not to target your ideal user. Okay, targeted or personalized marketing is an everyday part of most web users' experience. How do companies personalize this? And she talks in this that the this is an old thing. You know, we, we have to go back to the 1940s to begin with this, to identity scoring. Okay. And as we go ahead through the different stages, there's a timeline on there. Of course, we come to the GDPR. And one of the points that uh, you know, Tanya Kant pointed out was the legal loopholes such as legitimate interest, which has been discussed previously by other speakers, much more knowledgeable than myself on that topic. But of course, that is a big hole within the GDPR, legitimate interest, you know, as we all know when we go to look at cookies on the sites. And of course, the EU proposes a new Digital Service Act designed, uh, among other things, to restrict the use of personal data for targeted advertising purposes. Her summary is algorithmic targeting is never the simple computational process it might first seem to be. It is always bound up with ethically weighted social, cultural, political, and economic considerations, compounded by the fact that globally there are still very few legislative, legislative measures designed to truly regulate targeting and protect, protect users from both individual and collective pattern discriminations of, or system, systemic bias. And that's a very important point, that when I'm saying we are feeding the algorithm at all times, that's because it's practically impossible not to feed the algorithm. It's, it's very, very, very complicated. The previous speaker talked about some ways to, to protect ourselves, to, to work towards another internet. And I think he made, made a very important point there, that we have to, that, you know, there's the choice there. You know, if we're using kind of, American platforms, uh, Chinese platforms, if we're using these things, there's a choice there. But we don't really get to make a choice because if the platforms, the big platforms where, which we need to use on a daily basis to participate in society, to participate in our daily lives, are all on those platforms, to a certain degree, uh, um, you know, cookie, uh, the cookie programs, et cetera, are, are irrelevant because we are giving away our data to survive, to uh, to have our professions, to carry out our work, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and we, and it's a it's a circle that goes round and round and round. We participate, we through fear of missing out, through new characteristics of platforms, through governments adopting the use of those platforms, through local health authorities going onto Facebook. We are constantly feeding that beast feeding the algorithms. We talked, and many people have talked about uh, AI, and Sandrine earlier talked about some of the difficult uh, things about putting laws down around AI. And again, we have companies such as Clearview that completely ignore any of those law laws anyway, uh, or they ignore any of these requests by social media companies not to scrape them, Clearview being a face, uh, face recognition company that scraped more than 10, 10 billion photos from social media accounts. However, 
in Hamburg, the, uh, the Hamburg Commission for Data Protection and Freedom of Information act, uh, challenged them and said that the uh, Clearview AI data processing violates G GDPR. The, uh, said the, uh, some advocacy group claimed that the order that was uh, given in response to this to, to delete data was not strong enough, that more needed to happen uh, to Clearview. Uh, in France, there's been another case against Clearview, etc. Clearview tried to point out, or they, they say that they, they only work in the US, but they're scraping data from all around the world, creating these huge databases. And do we really have any redress or anything on that? I don't think, you know, I don't, that's open to debate whether these, uh, um, whether these regulations you know, and um, the authorities taking them and uh, saying that they are infringing, does it actually really change anything about how they operate? I don't know. And again, looking at AI and what's happening with AI, the Alphabet owned AI research lab DeepMind finally made a profit last year. And the interesting thing, how does it make money? DeepMind told CNBC it sells its software to other parts of the own company, such as Google and YouTube. It is powering projects and infrastructure that enrich the lives of billions through the many collaborations we have worked on across Alphabet over the years. So the AI owned by Google is essentially working on more ways of exploiting the data and selling it back to uh, Google and YouTube. So again, the circle is just going round and round and round. The analysis of the data that it is receiving is just being pumped back into those companies. And that is the only way that something like, for example, DeepMind, DeepMind can make a profit. Uh, we talk, you know, some people have talked about the the, the uh, idea of these kind of, you know, we need to take a stance. And Sandrine was pointing out in her talk the the kind of some of the steps being taken uh, about um, how to, uh, you know, to to control the the kind of more uh, advanced parts of AI and things like that. And I think it's important also that in the United States, there's been discussions about this because a lot of that stuff is taking place in the United States. And of course, we talked about the, the various harmful effects that we know of, um, you know, the, the typical things, maybe you don't get a job, maybe you don't get promoted, uh, maybe you don't get a bank loan, maybe your prison sentence is longer, maybe you don't get out of prison, and all of these things that are algorithmic decisions that are being taken. And as more and more money gets invested in this, and academics joke about it themselves. When it's when we raise money, it's AI. When we hire, it's machine learning. When we do the work, it's this. So academics are making jokes about those situations themselves. Theoretically, all of this algorithmic goodness and all of this information that we have should have been a very, very useful tool of track and trace in the uh, COVID thing, but it point, turned out not to be so in an application that you would imagine that finally we have a, a very useful application of this, but there is, and with the tracking apps and these things, but there have been no clear cases anywhere in the world where that has been successful. And finally, I find this possibly the most depressing part of all of this thing. And I understand that it's important under GDPR or something else uh, to define who we are. And I'd just like to have a quick look at that. Personal data means any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person data subject. I find that extremely depressing. I think that of all of the terms that we've come up with to describe humans and what we do and what we, what we have, uh, Late, lately, we've become, you know, we've been customers, we've been clients, we've become users, we're content creators. A data subject, I think, is possibly the most depressing mention of what we are. Are we just, you know, something that is only exists now into the data that we generate or the, the data that exists about us? Increasingly so. How can we fight back against that? How can we reclaim who we are as, as people rather than being data subjects? How can we uh, 
resist the kind of algorithmic structure. I think the, the previous speaker outlined some of those roles very well, some of the things we could do. We need to kind of take control of the technology we're using to use uh, free and open open source software. We need to, possibly the European Union is the only organization, the only structure in the world big enough to take on the kind of tech giants, but it also needs to decide where it's going within that. Does it want a surveillance capitalism, uh, much like the, the American companies or some of the Chinese companies, or does it want to use, you know, does it want to go in another direction? And, uh, you know, we heard about this kind of sharing of data and um, for beneficial purposes. So that's something that needs to be worked out. But as, as we currently stand, if we need to or want to use the internet for any purpose, we are subject to the algorithms that are feeding us and we are feeding back to them. And I think that when we are defined, that's what we, that's right now what we are, we are data subjects. Thank you. So if anybody has any questions. Thank you very much. Um, that was really interesting. I wait if there are questions. No, just two things. If so, if anybody's wondering where to buy or where to support musicians on platforms that are not Spotify, for example, there's a very good uh, platform called Bandcamp, uh, Bandcamp.com, which uh, which enables musicians to share their music and sell their music in a more uh, egalitarian way than uh, Spotify, um, which is a very big, very powerful organization. And I, I think for any of the other things, the previous speakers um, series of ideas about how to make a safer, you know, a better internet was, was very clear. I think there is no question, but there is one common, very interesting point of view on data subjects. Yes, I, I'm glad about that. Incidentally, during the break, I looked at the uh, I looked at the document that uh, Arianna Rossi uh, talked about that she she'd done a study on uh, the transparency of cookie banners, and I just took a quick a quick look at that. And in the in that document, I saw that eighty nine percent of all of the of the cookie banners that they looked at were infringing in some way or other. So I think that's a huge portion of you know. So we do have this um, you know in, we do have this increased uh, ability to block cookies, to block cookie banners, etc. But we still don't have any transparency within that. If we're looking at eighty nine percent of um, 89% of the ones that they analyzed were already, you know, were uh, violating the, the regulations. So I think it's a, a very interesting study. So everybody should have a quick, uh, have a look at that. I don't see any comments. Okay. So thank you very much, Chris. And I, um, last but not least, I introduce the next speaker, Ove Langfeld, who is a legal and policy officer at the European Commission and who talks about the GDPR and the main framework. So Ove, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for having me again this year. Um, so um, to close off, for um, how I get to have our quick first lunch break. What I'm going to do is to give a bit of an overview on you know, where is the GDPR after, I don't know, less than eight months in, in application and the links to some other um, files in the digital world. Um, so starting from that, um, main aim of the GDPR is indeed to have uh, protections that work for people in our digital worlds. So this we've had uh, since 2018 and you all know that there's been quite a long process before
before um, proposal came out in 2012 and even before we've had the consultations on how to directives. But now it is really the cornerstone of the digital policies. It sets the general framework for you know, a human-centric digital transition. All our recent legislative proposals from the uh, Data Governance Act that was mentioned, AI Act that was also mentioned, as well as the upcoming things like Data Act, the data space, they all embrace this idea. Um, there is quite a soaring ambition behind, and I will ah, up Sorry, better now. Sorry, I had an issue with my um, sound. I hope it's better now. If anyone could please give this sign. Okay, uh, better, thank you. Okay, sorry. Too many um, knobs to adjust. Um, so, quite a big ambition and we think in general it has worked. Um, this soaring ambition is indeed uh, sometimes phrased in well, legal language, which uh, may um, sometimes sound a bit dry, such as the data subject. Um, I mean, if you compare that to the German and French version, where, where it's betroffene person or person concerné par le traitement, um, that is the idea. We are, of course, people, and we are people who are affected by how data about us, our data are processed, and in that we should be protected and empowered. Um, but it's a fair point that legal language is sometimes a bit dry. Now, people have actually started even more to use these rights. We've had data from Eurostat that came out just recently on you know, more than half of people using uh, the rights to say no to cookies that many people have restricted or refused sharing location data and so on. So people are getting used to these rights and they're actually using them. That, that, that is on the side of the persons. Now on the side of the companies, um, their GDPR has also led to you know, additional harmonization compared to the situation before where we had a directive. And the first evaluation report that we did on the GDPR published in June 2020 also confirmed that, yes, um, we do have rules that are flexible enough to foster and allow for innovation and that the um, kind of reconciliation between having a high level of protection for individuals and creating a level playing field that fosters a free flow of data inside the union um, has worked. Um, that on that level, we already had Mr. Lemmer from the CMPD earlier today. And of course, the a key component for people to be able to trust the system is the enforcement system. We've got the DPA with um, increased powers. We have the cooperation mechanism between them, which also gives then companies on the other side a clear point of contact. Um, Mr. Lemmer mentioned already you know, the numerous cases in which the CNPD has participated in the EDPB um, cooperation mechanisms. Now, to give kind of the, the whole statistics, by end of last year, we've had close to 1,900 cross-border cases in the EDPB case register, which led to more than 600 mutual assistance procedures. And beside those points, we've had um, voluntary procedures to assist each other in cross-border cases, and there's been more than 7,000 since. And for the one-stop shop, which was also the um, 
mentioned in Mr. Lemmert's presentation on the one huge fine issued by the Luxembourg DPA. Um, we've had th also more than 300 final decisions following the one-stop shop over the, all of Europe. So this cooperation between the national DPA is really becoming a lived daily practice and the data protection authorities are ready to send clear messages to those who do not comply with GDPR. Um, there's the unnamed Luxembourg case, but also big fines, for example, against WhatsApp. And we are quite sure that this will continue with the independent DPAs using their teeth to bite controllers that do not comply. Now, of course, um, every new framework, there's always room for improvement. And we have already seen that following the evaluation report, the EDPB has worked on its procedures. And we really welcome that from the side of the commission. And of course, we support you know, further efforts towards building a truly common European data protection culture, including an enforcement and inside the EDPB. Um, so much in a way on the inside, what's on the outside with, and it's been mentioned before, for example, by Ms. Rapota and in her presentation that there's been quite a lot of, in French, you would say rayonnement of the GDPR outside the EU. Um, it has led other countries to adopt laws or to ad adapt their existing laws. There's also, as evidenced by her presentation, work in international organizations ongoing to work on data protection and privacy protection. And that, of course, also something that we really see and welcome and see as a good global effect of GDPR and the European data protection model more broadly. On a practical manner, um, talking about transfer tools, um, we have last summer modernized the uh, standard contractual clauses, which can help controllers um, to um, comply with their obligations more easily and give them good templates to start from, both on the international transfer aspect as well as on the controller process, controller processor aspects. So there we have provided tools for controllers, organizations more generally to streamline their compliance efforts. Um, plus, we're also working you know, on the global level, for example, in the context of the OECD, to really bring forward the global privacy agenda. Because of course, there are different approaches in different countries and difficult questions to be solved regarding issues such as law enforcement access to data. But on this, really, we're continuing work with our international partners to bring this forward. Um, so that a bit on the state of play on the GDPR. Um, linking to some other files that are either have been adopted or are in the legislative process and how they interact with GDPR. Um, one point that um, showed also how the principles of the GDPR also fit during the pandemic is the approach taken by the EU on the EU Digital COVID Certificate, which you know, within the framework of the GDPR minimizes, minimized the amount of data processed, shows an architecture that is uh, data protection 
friendly without you know, huge central databases, very rather decentralized system. And it has really been one of the key tools to enable um, free movement inside the EU and also to facilitate in general travel and help to support the European tourism industry. And it's actually also a tool that let's say for the technical specifications below has been adopted by many other countries around the world. It is the really on the way to becoming the global standards used by countries across four continents for issuing their own certificates. It is also, and let me just as an aside from the data protection side aspects, strictly speaking, um, it is really quite an impressive achievement that such an interoperable system at such a scale has been deployed so quickly. Um, that is, I mean, it's been built really in a matter of a couple of months. That is really impressive in that sense. And yeah, as I mentioned, it really follows the GDPR principles of minimizing what data is processed. So that actually worked quite well. And we've also seen that in the replies from the data protection authorities when uh, we consulted the EDPS and the EDPP for a joint opinion on the proposal back in last spring. They have, and they acknowledged that um, this was a good way to deal with those issues. Of course, had several recommendations, which then fed into the process later on. But of course, that is precisely the, the, the purpose of those consultations. Um, that on EODCC. Um, on the different other proposals that are currently in the legislative process or still upcoming on the following from the uh, data strategy. We've got the Data Governance Act on access to data and reusing information there. There, um, the status is that the trilogue, so the negotiations between the European Parliament and the Council have had a political agreement at near the end of last year. So now this is in the process of being cleaned up and then being formally adopted. So it should be out quite soon. The other proposals in this area, so Digital Services Act, more on platform regulation um, and illicit content. Their parliament and council have each adopted their positions to go into the negotiations with each other. And they are starting basically these days. And then it is for the co-legislator to see how to reconcile their two positions and come to an agreement on that file. While for the Digital Markets Act, which is more, which is the aspect of um, more from a competition perspective, addressing the power of certain uh, gatekeepers. Um, I don't have to name names, but you can guess um, what big players in the um, in, in the digital area this is about, and it is meant to ensure that markets remain open to new challenges to these um, kind of big players. There, the Parliament and Council already had um, established their respective positions a bit before Christmas and have started the negoti negotiations with each other. So those trilogues there are also ongoing. Now, what is 
still in the pipeline new to come. Some of these things have been alluded to by earlier panelists as well. We've got the Data Act that is in the pipeline under preparation by the Commission, which will um, address fair conditions for access to data in the data economy. So it will cover several different aspects there from improving possibility for users of services to share data with third parties of their choosing. So always in this empowering the user logic, right? as well as um, several other questions on, for example, business to government data sharing, um, cloud contracts, and so on. And finally, as the last new proposal that is in the pipeline and which is interesting for you also to hear about here is what is in the pipeline on the European health data space, where in the end there will be kind of two legs to the proposal, one on further empowering people to make decisions about the information specifically in the health sector. And on a second leg, the questions of reuse for research purposes. So that is also coming there. And it's been also alluded to before by other panelists. So that as a kind of an overview of you know, what happened with GDPR, what will come out in the near future in terms of new proposals and the state of play on the proposals that have been put forward by the commission in the past time. Um, I forgot Artificial Intelligence Act. Since that one was published a bit later, it came out in April last year, it's still earlier in the process than the you know, Digital Services Act, Digital Markets Act. So on AI Act, for example, some of the parliament committees that are part of the procedure have just nominated their rapporteurs. So this will still take a bit more time. But as a um, general point of the kind of the general architecture in all of these um, proposals is that they tend to follow the logic of the GDPR, meaning putting the people whose data are processed in the center and giving them control over what happens and the corresponding obligations on those who do process the data as controllers and processors to, um, you know, keep them securely, be transparent about them, basically be accountable, because that is in the end the very short version of data protection rules for, from the perspective of an organization that processes personal data. It's have a good reason for what you're doing, be transparent about it, do it securely, and be able to demonstrate the three above. That is basically data protection law in a nutshell. Um, on this, I've spoken quite a lot and don't want to impede more on lunch break time, but thanks again for having me um, and ready to take questions. Thank you. If there are no questions coming in now, I can have one footnote related to Ms. Munoz's earlier intervention on the topic of research. Um, and that is that as part of its work on 
guidelines in general. The EDPB is also working on research guidelines. That is one thing that the Commission had also called for or invited them to do in the 2020 GDPR evaluation report. And as part of an input to that process, we have sent them a list of questions, which was still back in summer 2020, to which they already replied on some aspects on data protection in research. Um, the EDPB reply is public and provides some guidance already, but of course, um, many of those questions will be addressed then in detail in the research guidelines that are currently under preparation and which will be like any EDPB guidelines uh, subject to a public consultation process so that once EDPB among itself has agreed on a text for the guidelines they will be put out the public will be able to comment and afterwards they see how to integrate the comments from that public consultation phase into the final version of the guidelines. So many of the questions such as um, pseudonymization in research, how to inform people about research legal basis, um, many of these things will be clarified there as well as specifically on uh, pseudonymization, anonymization, and another set of guidelines that is under preparation. So um, there's plenty of more to come, but we are aware that there are open questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ove. I don't see any questions left in the chat, actually. So I would like to say thank you, Ove, for your contribution. I think it was a very nice talk and very in, very in insightful information that you provided to us in with the updates on GDPR and everything. So thank you, Ove. So uh, this was the last talk for today. So I would like actually to thank all of our partners for having contributed to this very interesting and uh, insightful conference of today. And uh, I really appreciate all the sessions that we had. And by this, I would like to thank our partners, starting with the CNPD, the University of Luxembourg, the European Commission, Be Secure, the International Atomic Energy Agency for providing us a keynote speaker this year, the APDL, of course, and Elving of us as our guest speaker this year. And by this, I would like to say thank you very much for uh, having joined us today. And of course, not to forget all the helping members that were contributing to organize this conference this year in these special constraints in the framework of the COVID pandemic still. And also a special thank you to Constance Metzger from the university for moderating this event and the WebEx channel, of course. Thank you very much, Constance. So uh, another information, perhaps, if you need a certificate of attendance, feel free to send an email to communication at ristina.lu. And now I would like to address to give the word over to Sandrine, maybe you have to add something for closing. Yeah, yeah. I also want to 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 thank you all the participants uh, to to attend to this meeting to the to the speaker because I think that regarding data privacy, I think we we celebrate quite well with the diversity, various topics, very expertise also, and uh, I hope that you will be uh, numerous to attend uh, next year. I'm really happy, and I hope that you. You learn things. You also for the speaker that you appreciate to to participate to her data privacy day. Thank you very much, and not forget the audience of course. Thank you very much for having joined us this year. It was a pleasure for having you. You were a very nice audience, and you were great. Thank you so much. So I hope to see you back on next year's edition on the on Monday next year. So the week will start quite quietly with an event. So mark your calendars. Next year, Monday, 30th of January, we will be back with the next edition. And with this, I would like to say goodbye, enjoy your day, and see you back next year. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.